Hi, it's Andy again at Concord Food Co-op Organic Gardens. We are here at Canterbury Shaker Village. And it's a little earlier in the morning this time. And I am going to show you how to cut some grass with a scythe. So this is the scythe that I'll be using today. This has an all-purpose blade, but it's good for grass on it. And this is specifically a European-style scythe. There's two different types of scythe. The one that you might be more used to seeing with that super curvy looking handle is an American scythe and they're often much heavier. Uh, they're made in a different in a different process. So this one is super thin and lightweight and it's easy to keep razor sharp which is important when you're trying to cut grass. So this is the style that I prefer to use. Other people do use the American types. That's often the, ty the kind that you're going to find at a barn sale or something. Um, but I would recommend starting with the European scythe, I think you're going to have much greater success. Functionally, the scythe is just a big knife on a stick, and it's just a way of cutting things close to the ground without bending over. It's similar to a sickle, which is also a knife on a small handle, uh, but this is going to be used for harvesting grass, cutting grass or hay, and also sometimes you'll see these with a little attachment on them called a grain cradle, and you can use this to cut grain as well. This is essential to have when you're mowing with a scythe. Uh, this is a whetstone, and I keep it in this metal holster, which just clips right on my belt. That keeps water in there uh, for when I'm sharpening. And you're going to need to sharpen this about every five minutes as you're mowing. It's a bit of a pain, but it keeps it nice and sharp, and it'll make it a lot easier as you go. So I'm about to put a new edge on this, uh, just sharpen it up a little bit. I carry around this little brush in my pocket. Um, it's a bit bulky and inconvenient. You can also use a rag or the old timers will take just grass that they've cut already and wipe the blade down with this. But you want to make sure that the blade is nice and clean and free of grass and dirt before you start sharpening. That will interfere with the stone making proper contact with the metal. Now I'm going to take out my side stone and you can see it's sort of canoe shaped. This is very typical for a stone that's used on a European style scythe and it's wet and I start at the fat end of the blade at the rear and I'm letting this this part of the stone contact the top of the blade right here. And there's a bit of a lip there and that gives the right angle for the, the bottom of this stone to contact the blade and I'm going to be pulling Overlapping my strokes about an inch, inch and a half, and working my hands and my stone down the blade at the same time. I am by no means a master of this skill. It takes hours and hours and hours and hours of practice, but I can get my blade to a reasonable sharpness. You can run your thumb across the back of the blade, and you're feeling for just a slight catchiness. Once you feel that, that is a burr that's metal being curled over the edge a little bit, and that means that you've actually fully sharpened the blade. I'm not feeling that quite yet, so I'm going to do one more pass with my stone, but I'm going to do a, a lighter second pass. So again, starting, overlapping, and I'm moving my hand sort of down and to the right as I go, stabilizing with my other hand and moving the blade slowly. And the final thing I do is just to try and clean up that burr a little bit, which I can now feel. Uh, I take the flat part of my stone and I just run it really gently a couple times across the entire length of the blade. You'll also see some people when they sharpen, they'll do one stroke on this side and one stroke on this side, one stroke on this side, one stroke on this side. I find that to be a little bit harder for me uh, personally, so I just do it this way instead. I'm about to start mowing now that my blade is sharp and the tendency when you pick up a scythe is to sort of do this like swingy motion and use a lot of your arms and fight that tendency at all costs. Instead I'm going to be thinking circles in my brain at all times. Essentially when you use this, this blade is so long because you want to start cutting the grass at the tip and you want to finish cutting the grass all the way at the far end. And the way that you accomplish that is by cutting in sweeping circular motions. I'm basically keeping my arms locked in a slightly bent elbow position, and I'm using, uh, it's actually similar to proper paddling form in a canoe, but I'm sort of like coiling my abdominal muscles, and then I'm releasing that. I'm using my abs, I'm pushing off with this leg and my butt. Those are the muscles that I'm using, those are your strong core muscles. 
If you're just using your arms all day long, you're gonna fatigue so fast. Another thing that can be helpful is actually turning your head with your body. It helps to reinforce that circular motion and keeping your arms locked tight. And you can see how most of the grass is getting deposited at the end of my stroke in what's called a windrow. And that's really helpful when it comes time to pick up the grass because it's lined up nice and neat. I'm trying to keep my blade hovering right over the ground. And I'm moving forward just a couple inches every time and just cutting a bit more. Again, this is a skill that requires hours and hours and hours to master. And there are certain parts of the world where this tool, tool is still used to this day. Um, there's alpine farms that can't access their pastures with machinery. And there's also a lot of cultures in Eastern Europe that still use the side to cut grass. One of the nice things about cutting grass with a scythe is you can let it grow a lot taller than you could with a lawnmower, but you want to be careful that you're cutting the grass before it fully seeds out. So here is an example of, this is quack grass and it's starting to make a spike, um, but it hasn't even started flowering yet. It's still in its early stages of seed formation. So if I cut this grass now, there's going to be no ripe grass seed in the hay when I'm finished. So again, yeah, it gives me a lot more control over the timing of when I cut this hay, and that's something that I really enjoy about it. Another thing that I enjoy about using a scythe is it's, it's quiet. I can hear birds when I'm using it. I'm not listening to a lawnmower, I'm not listening to a weed whacker, I just hear a gentle swish swish of the scythe through the grass. So it's very, um, it's a peaceful activity. It's also, as of late, given me a lot of time to reflect and think about world events, and that's also something that I enjoy just time and space to do. When it's time to mow my next windrow, I move in the same direction as before. So you can see that we have the first windrow laid down and now I'm moving in the same direction so that I have an empty, clean place to cut and leave my next windrow. Uh, if the grass is shorter, uh, it can also be possible to move up and then loop back, do a U-turn and then loop back. And so you're getting two swaths into one row. But when the grass is this long, I find it easier to just do one swath into one windrow and then keep moving in that same direction. So yeah, it's a bit of walking back to, to start the next windrow, but I find it's worth it. Now about two weeks later since I cut the grass, I wasn't necessarily planning on leaving it that long, but one thing led to another and here we are. Uh, it's been really dry lately and so this grass is reduced in size considerably. You can also use it fresh cut, but you're going to want to put it down thicker because a lot of that is water. Uh, what we're going to do today is basically just pick up this grass out of the windrows, load it into the wagon, and then show you how we put it into the garden. I like using the classic three-tine pitchfork for this job, and I just work my way down the windrow, just picking up the grass, moving it along. You can also push it down the windrow, but there's the grass has actually started growing up underneath this, so that's a little bit more difficult to do at the moment. And once you get a good amount, take the grass, and I'm loading it up in this wagon that we pull behind the tractor. You could also do this with a cart or just walk it around if your garden is small enough. Here we have a bed that has been recently tilled and shaped and fertilized. And now I'm going to go ahead and put down some of this hay that we cut as mulch. And I love putting mulch wherever I can in the gardens because it provides armor to protect the soil from heavy rain. It keeps moisture in the soil longer. It protects the soil from UV radiation. Keeps the soil temperature cooler in the summer. 
suppresses weeds. There's like innumerable benefits of mulch. Uh, so I really like using mulch wherever I can. One of the things that I've found is that roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of garden space and mulch growing space is what I need uh, here. And this is a process that you can call transfer mulch because I'm growing the mulch in another location, cutting it, and then bringing it into the garden. So I'm taking the mulch off the wagon, we've driven it over closer to the garden, and plopping it right down on the bed. And then we're trying to get a couple inches thick of mulch. If you're putting it down green, again, you're going to want to put it thicker because it will dry down and reduce in volume. It's always better to go a little thicker than thinner uh, because it's annoying to have to hand weed a whole mulch bed. Once you put this down, you're not going to be able to hoe it or do other things with uh, equipment. So I like to get it down nice and thick. Here we have the finished mulched bed and that is ready for transplanting, which I'm going to plant more scallions into that next week. So that's it for everything from cutting grass with a scythe to mulching. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time. If you're in the mood for real food, it's Concord Food Co-op.